So today's a little bit different of a day for me. I woke up yesterday morning about five o'clock with one of my kids sick, and we ended up taking him to the ER and got him meds, got home from taking him to the ER, and another one of the kids was sick, so took him to the clinic, which was open then, got him meds. By the time we got back with his meds, we had a third kid that was sick. Um, so I feel great, <laughs> but... As soon as I walk through this crowd shaking hands, hugging people like a normal Sunday morning, I'll go home and I'll start running a fever, and then you'll all have it too. So I'm doing what I call contagious kid protocol. That means I showed up right before communion started, I hid out in the lobby, and as soon as I get through preaching, Josh, I'm going to volunteer or ask. I'm going to ask you to come up during the invitation. I'm going to scoot because I don't want to share with people. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to do it this way, uh, because I miss getting to talk to all of you. Hi. It's good to see all of you. And uh, I'll just go ahead and say it because I forget at the end. Bye. And so um, we're doing it for you. You might want to bring Lysol up here, but I'll try to stay away from your podium. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, I'm a dad of five. I know how that story goes, so... What I want to do this morning is I want to start in the same place we did last week, which is Genesis 1, and if you have your Bibles, you can go and open there. Uh, But I want to take a slightly different course through Scripture this morning and look at a slightly different part of the story we were telling. It doesn't change the story we told last week, but it kind of nuances it a little bit. We're going to dig in just a little bit deeper. If uh, last week we were looking at the story of the Christian church or the story of Jesus or the story of the Bible from 10,000 feet, today we want to go just a little bit lower and look at one particular part of that story. And as you're turning to Genesis 1, one of the things that I need to start off with, if we're going to kind of get what this story is all about, I need to remind you that sometimes with a text like Genesis 1, the creation narrative, we've read it for so long and we know it so well that sometimes we forget just how foreign or how weird of a text it is. We kind of start to miss the power of of what was going on. And so if we want to understand the story that we're going to see in Scripture that God is telling us this morning, I have to start just a minute or two at the beginning and try to remind you of the weirdness of this text. And by the way, when I use that word weird, we live in a house, the Sparks household is a term where weird is a positive thing, not a negative thing. So we have t-shirts that say weird is a side effect of awesome. And so sometimes we need to remember that the Bible is weird because when we grasp the weirdness of it, we see the power of it. Okay, Genesis 1 was written in a world where Israel had all of these neighbors and all of their neighbors had their own gods. And in that world where all of their neighbors had their own gods, every nation that had their own god would tell a creation story in which their god was the supreme god. Their God was the big God. Their God was the one who was in charge. Now, oftentimes they all had more than one God. And so what they would do in that case is say, well, there are all of these gods, but our God in our nation is the biggest and the baddest of all of those gods. And so these creation narratives abound. One of the oldest living stories that we have, archaeologists have discovered, is called the Enuma Elish. And it's a Babylonian creation story. And in the Enuma Elish, it says the world was created when, just so happens to be their chief god, Marduk, comes along and destroys all of the other contenders for the throne, and through that victory, he creates the world. That's the way Israel's neighbors worked back in the day. And in those stories, usually what ended up happening is that the chief god of whatever nation, Marduk or Molech or Baal or whoever you want it to be, they would go into battle with some primordial force or some giant monster, and they would defeat that giant monster that the world thought existed at that time back then. And through that defeat, that's how the creation of the world came about. It was the defeat of the monsters that did that. But also, always in those creation narratives, Marduk or Bel or Molech or whoever would always end fighting these monsters really really struggle with it. It wasn't one of those things where like we go into the fight knowing who was going to win. It was one of those things where the outcome was really uncertain. And so it was a giant struggle. It was a great battle in all of those stories. And so Israel lived in this world where all of their neighbors were telling these stories. 
about their gods, and their gods are the reason the world came about because their god defeated this great monster or this set of great monsters, and it was through that victory that everything came to be that we now know and experience. And so one of the things going on in Genesis chapter 1 scholars have long said is that Moses in writing the true creation account of the true God is he's writing it in such a way that he's getting digs in at all of those neighboring nations and their stories about their gods. He's telling the story in such a way that it would be clear to anyone reading it that not only is our God the chief of gods, but our God is so ridiculously above the notion of any other God that it would be crazy to even consider those other gods exist. And so you see things throughout the creation narrative that show the superiority of God. In that sense, if you remember your playground days, it's something like a grand theological version of my dad can beat up your dad. In one sense, that's what Genesis 1 is doing. And so there's one particular part of Genesis 1 I want to show you this morning to kind of get into this story that we're going to tell today. And that's starting in verse 20 of chapter 1. In verse 20, God said, let the water swarm with living things and let birds fly above the earth up in the dome of the sky. And God created, and then my translation says something really tame here. Yours yours probably does too. It says, God created the great sea animals and all the tiny living things that swarm in the waters, each according to its kind and all the winged birds and each according to its kind. God created the great sea animals animals. And all of my life, I've read the Genesis account, and I've grown up going to church, and I've wondered, what are the great sea animals? There was a long time in my youth where I wanted to be a marine biologist because I was in love with whales. I just I was fascinated by dolphins and whales, and man, to live and see a blue whale. And I thought to myself, maybe the great sea animals that he's talking about here are those kinds of creatures, because I don't know if you know this, but if you go out in the ocean, there's some pretty big critters out there, Right? Don't know if you know this, if you go down to the dam at Watts Bar Lake and get low enough, there's some pretty big critters down there too. But maybe that's what he means by great sea animals. But what I was falling victim to, I would learn later on, is that I was making the story a lot more boring than it should have been. Because the word he uses in Hebrew that we translate this kind of bland, vanilla, great sea animal was in the ancient world a word used for one of those monsters that everybody's gods were fighting in their creation narratives. You find this monster referenced several places throughout the Bible, usually in very poetic passages. And Genesis 1, by the way, is one of those poetic passages. His name is typically Leviathan. Now, show of hands, how many of you studied the Old Testament long enough that you know who Leviathan is? Okay, we've got a few people In the book of Job, when Job has demanded that he hold God accountable for all that is happening, he says, I want to be the judge and I want to ask questions to God, and and God actually shows up. But God asks Job questions, starting in Job 38. One of the things he questions Job about is this monster, Leviathan. He says, Job, did you create Leviathan, this great monster of the sea that breathes fire and has impenetrable scales that no man could ever hope to control? He says, Job, can you create him? Job, can you control him? Because I created him and I control him, God says to Job. The word used in Genesis chapter 1 for great sea animal is the word used in the rest of the Bible to refer to this great sea monster. And what I want you to see in the poetry of Genesis 1 this morning, this is what I think Moses was saying. In a world where everybody around them says, no, our God is the biggest and the baddest God, and he's the one who through great might and great effort defeated these sea monsters like Leviathan, and so you should worship him. Moses says, no, let me tell you about the real God. Let me tell you about the God who not only can defeat the monsters, but he created the monster that your God struggle with, and that monster that your God struggle with in your story, our God treats it like a pet. Who's the bigger God now? And so what I want you to take away from it this morning as we start is this. Our God is a God that is big enough that he's bigger than the monsters of our world. Can you get down with that? Because although we tell our kids that monsters do not exist, 
Although we tell our kids there's nothing hiding under the bed, and maybe in a literal sense there is nothing hiding under the bed, we all realize that we do live in a world of monsters. We live in a world where there are forces that are bigger than us, that are beyond our control, that we have no chance as we stand against them. And sometimes we look out at the world and we just stand in the face of it all and we feel helpless and we feel vulnerable and we feel like there's nothing we can do. And Moses says, your God is bigger than those monsters. I'm thinking about gods like the stock market. How many of you guys remember 2007? Anybody have a house that they got upside down on in 2007? We bought a house in 2006. We bought it for a very reasonable price. We stayed within our budget, and the next year the stock market crashes, and all of a sudden this house that wasn't worth a lot to begin with was worth a lot less. We had no control over that. I had a friend who had retired, had been retired a long time, who was this close to having to go back to work because his retirement portfolio tanked. We live in a world full of monsters. But God is bigger than those monsters. And so in a world where everybody was saying, our God struggled mightily against the monster, and he just barely by the skin of his teeth defeated him, but that makes him the greatest. Moses says, you guys don't know anything about anything. And so this morning I want to start by thinking about the monsters in our world. And each of you could name your own particular set of monsters, but our God is not only bigger than the other gods of this world, which is one of the things that Moses was saying, our God's so much bigger than your God, it's not even worth considering, but he's also bigger than the monsters of our world. He's bigger than Washington. He's bigger than Moscow. He's bigger than the Middle East. He's bigger than the stock market. He's bigger than whatever diagnosis the doctor can call you with. Our God is the God who is bigger. Not only bigger than the gods, but also bigger than the monsters. But there's a second story I want to share with you as we go through the Bible this morning. And if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Exodus chapter 6. And I was thinking about this this morning as I was getting ready to come late as it was. But you realize, and you've probably experienced this too, that in a world where there are all sorts of false gods, our false gods also have a tendency of becoming monsters. For several years when I was living in South Texas, I was privileged to be a part of a leadership team for Celebrate Recovery chapter. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with Celebrate Recovery, but what we would do is we would bring people in from the church and the community and we would would help people find healing from all sorts of what we called hurts and hang-ups and habits. And so there were nights when I was leading my Celebrate Recovery group where I would sit around the table with a man here who had been abused by a legalistic, uh, a legalistic and abusive church, and he was trying to recover from that. And he was discovering Jesus for the first time in his life. And you could see the light in his eyes as he was learning that Jesus was so much more than what he thought he was. And he was sitting next to a man who was struggling with recovering from what he had done to his family through his unfaithfulness. And he was sitting next to a man who was a drug addict, who was sitting next to a man with anger issues, who was sitting next to a man who was a drug dealer. And all of these people came together to learn the way of Jesus and how Jesus could set them free from the gods that they established for themselves that turned into monsters. Our false gods have a way of becoming monsters, don't they? Those things as we go out into the world that we seek security or comfort or meaning or happiness in that make promises and we think, oh, now we have found what we're looking for, but they turn out to be just as monstrous as the things that we're running away from. I remember when I was early in my ministry career talking to a man who had been sober for 15 years through Alcoholics Anonymous. I asked him one day as we got to know each other well, I said, John, why... Why did you start drinking in the first place? And he said, I started drinking because I hated who I was. He said, I was a shy kid. I was short. I was small. The girls never even noticed me, much less not like me. I mean, like they didn't even know I exist. They couldn't even say I don't like you. He said, I was awkward. He said, everything about me was wrong. He said, but I quickly discovered that when I was drunk, I was 10 feet tall I was bulletproof, I was funny, and everyone loved who I was. And he said, all of those things that I was seeking, comfort and security and acceptance and meaning, he says, I found that in the bottom of a bottle of beer. Beer. 
And he said, that worked great until that God showed me how empty it was and I realized that I was a slave to it. And so in Genesis 1, God is bigger than the gods of this world, but he's also bigger than the monsters of the, of, of, let me talk, monsters of this world. But in Exodus chapter 6, what I want to show you is that God is also bigger than those false gods that become monsters. This is right in the middle of the Exodus story. This is when the people of Israel are crying out for redemption from God. You realize they had gone down into Egypt for salvation, that going to Egypt had actually saved their lives, but as subsequent generations came along, that thing that had provided them safety at one point in their life turned into the thing that enslaved them. That source of security, that source of comfort, that source of sustenance and survival became the thing that pushed them down. And at the head of that Egyptian system of doing things was Pharaoh, who in Exodus chapter 1 looked out amongst the Hebrews and he was scared of them, so he enslaved them, he oppressed them, he ordered genocide against their young boys. And in the Egyptian world, Pharaoh was a god. He was a god who became a monster. And so the people cry out to God in the darkness of their slavery. And in Exodus chapter 6, this is after God has sent Moses back into Egypt. This is after he has already started confronting Pharaoh, let my people go. This is after Pharaoh has already said that he's not going to give up very easily. This is what God says. At the end of chapter 5, Moses turns to the Lord, back up in verse 22 of chapter 5. He says, why have you abused this people? Why did you send me for this? Ever since I first came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has abused this people. You have done absolutely nothing to rescue your people. But then I want you to look and see what he says in verse 2 of Exodus chapter 6. God also said to Moses, he says, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but I didn't reveal myself to any of them by my name, the Lord. I also set up my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they lived as immigrants. I also heard the cry of grief of the Israelites whom the Egyptians have turned into slaves, and I've remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I'll bring you out from, the, from Egyptian forced labor. I'll rescue you from your slavery to them. I'll set you free with great power, with momentous events of justice. I'll take you as my people, and I will be your God. You will know that I, the Lord, am your God, who has freed you from the Egyptian forced labor. I'll bring you into the land that I promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Now, one of the things about this text that we need to point out is that every time he says, I am the Lord, in your Old Testament, that's a key that he's using that name that he gave Moses in Exodus 3 at the burning bush. In Exodus 3, Moses at the burning bush, and he says, now you're going to send me to the people, and I'm going to say, God has said, let's get out of here. And they're going to say, well, which God sent you? And he responded at the burning bush, I am that I am. And for the rest of the Old Testament, the way they would shorten that name that God gives Moses at the burning bush is to say, the Lord. And so every time he says in Exodus 6, I am the Lord, you need to remember at the beginning, he says, I am the Lord. I'm going to do this, he says at the end, because I am the Lord. You go tell Israel that I am the Lord. Every time he says that, he's saying, go tell them that I am the I am. And there's a lot we could say about that name, and we could spend hours on that name, and we're not going to because you want lunch. But this morning, I just want to point out that it's not the I was, not the I will be, but the I am, the God who is present. And in Exodus chapter 6, God teaches Moses something very particular about what it means to worship the God who is present. The I am is the God who in the moment hears the cry of his people, who answers the cry of his people, who acts to redeem his people from the darkness and the slavery created by the monsters that we worship in this world. That is what it means for us to say that the God we worship is the I am. That is what it means for us to say that the God we worship is present. That is, he is the God who is present to save and redeem because he is bigger than the monsters we create. And what does he do from Exodus chapter 6 on? 
Continuing through the plagues, he goes to war against the gods of Egypt, and he redeems his people. He liberates his people. He sets them free from that monstrous force that held them down. And so what I want you to see this morning as we go from Genesis 1 to Exodus 6 is that God is bigger than all of the gods in this world. All of the things that people worship, all of the things that people hold up, he's bigger than those things. And he's also bigger than all the monsters in this world. And he's even bigger than all of the gods that we worship that turn into monsters. So even when I'm at the bottom of that pit that I dug myself through stupid decisions, God is bigger than that. God is bigger than alcoholism. God is bigger than unfaithfulness. God is bigger than our anger. God is bigger than our workaholicism. God is bigger than whatever you want to fill in the blank with there. All of those forces that make false promises to us and come to oppress us and hold us down and humanize us. The I am says, I am the one who hears the cry out of the brokenness and I am big enough to answer. Let me share one more story with you this morning. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn one more time, this time to 1 Peter Chapter 5. First Peter, we, we talked about Second Peter last week. This week we'll talk about First Peter. And First Peter, they're really wrestling with some of those monsters. They're living in a world where everyone is antagonistic to Christianity. Everyone is antagonistic to what they're doing. They're being persecuted in various forms. And how many of you could imagine, this is audience participation, give me a, a, a nod, a, a knowing smile, or a raise of your hand. How many of you could imagine if in, in circumstances of persecution, there's some anxiety that comes with that, right? A little bit of stress. And so Peter writing to this group of people, this is what he says. Verse 6. He says, first, I want you to humble yourself under God's power so that he may raise you up in the last day. And in doing that, in verse 7, he says, second, you can throw all of your anxiety on him because he cares about you. Now, I don't know what your translation says. Mine doesn't do that phrase in verse 6, justice. Because literally what it says in Greek is, humble yourself not under God's power, but under the mighty hand of God. And it's the only time in the New Testament he uses that phrase, the only time you're going to find it. But if you look in the Old Testament, you'll find it in various places. But almost always when that phrase is used, under the mighty hand of God, he's talking about the Exodus. He's talking about God going to battle with Pharaoh, defeating Pharaoh and bringing his people out of slavery in Egypt. And the reason he uses that phrase, it turns out, is because it was Pharaoh's phrase. It was Pharaoh's expression of power back in the day. He would say things like, everything from the rising to the sun to the setting of the sun is under the mighty hand of Pharaoh. It was a way of Pharaoh saying, I'm the biggest, I'm the baddest, I'm the one in charge. And so when God comes in and says, Psh, the mighty hand of Pharaoh, let me show you the mighty hand of God. It was a way of showing God's superiority God's sovereignty, God's bigness, God's power. And so Peter's speaking to this group of people who are dealing with stress and persecution and anxiety and hardship and struggle. He says, what I need you to do is I need you to put yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Because you realize, don't you, that there are actually very few things in your life that you can control. I mean, that makes my blood pressure rise just a little bit to say that. But if you think about it for a second, there are just very few things in your life that you are actually in control of. Most of the time I can ignore this. There are times when I can't, like when I get on an airplane. Um, I will not name names, but there's one particular person in my household who does not like flying. And she's always said, I would feel better about flying if I could be the one in the cockpit. And I would say, but you don't know how to fly. She said, at least I would be in charge as we died right? Sometimes I can ignore the fact that I'm not in control, but sometimes I have to face the fact that my life is in the hands of something bigger than me or other than me or different than me. And that makes me feel helpless. That makes me feel anxious. That stresses me out. I used to have hair on the top of my head. 
But Peter, speaking to a group that was dealing with things much bigger than they were, says, here's what you need to do. Put yourself under the mighty hand of God. Because it's true up against the Roman Empire, there's not a lot that you can do. And it's true up against the Jewish forces aligned against you. There's not a whole lot that you can do. You don't have a lot of control. But do you know who does? God. And the God who is bigger than all of the gods of this world. And the God who is bigger than all of the monsters of this world. And the God who is even bigger than the gods that we create that turn into monsters. He is the God who at the proper time will lift you up. Because even though you may not be in control of much, he is in control. He is bigger. He is more powerful than all of it. And so all of those anxieties... All of those worries, all of that stress, all of those things that you struggle with, you can trust God with those things. Because there's nothing in this world that he's not bigger than. And he cares for you. God is bigger than our monsters. God is bigger than those things that we set up with all of their empty promises that fail us and oppress us. And hold us down. I'm not going to keep you from your lunch any longer, but I just want to read one more text for you. And I'm going to let this, if you will, go ahead and stand. I'm going to let this kind of serve as a prayer. And I want you just to listen to this. And this is the God we serve in the midst of scary and dark and stressful and anxious and broken times. And after I read this, I'm going to walk out the back door and I'm going to hold my breath all the way down that aisle. And we're going to sing a song. And if you need to put yourself under God's control this morning, you can trust him. He's big enough. But not only is he big enough, but he loves you. So listen to these words. So what are we going to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also freely give us all things with him? Who will bring a charge against God's elect people? It is God who acquits them, who is going to convict them. It is Christ Jesus who died, even more, who was raised, who also is at God's right side. It is Christ Jesus who pleads our case for us. Who will separate us from Christ's love? Will we be separated by trouble or distress or harassment or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, we are being put to death all the day long for your sake. We are treated like sheep for slaughter. But in all these things, we win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Not death, not life, not angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth or any other thing that is created. Amen.